On the program today, ShopRite shares rise on higher sales and Nigeria divestment plan. Businesses in Nigeria struggle to survive as dollar scarcity bites. And Kenya Airways resumes international flights after virus curbs lifted. Thank you for joining us and welcome to Business Incorporated. I'm Chimizi Obi Wago. Let's get the show started with the markets. And here in Africa, the markets in South Africa and Nigeria were in the positive territory at intraday. The JSC index gained the most by 0.58%, while Nigeria's main index rose marginally by 0.06%. The market in Egypt is still closed for the holiday, but ended Wednesday's session positive. Kenya closed negative on Thursday. And only the markets in the United Arab Emirates resumed trading today after the Eid holidays, while other Middle East markets remained closed. Abu Dhabi's index was up 0.45% at intraday, while the Dubai index rose 0.71%. And in Europe, stocks uh, whipsawed this morning as another big week for corporate earnings kicked off while U.S. lawmakers attempt to hammer out a new coronavirus aid package. Well, let's bring in Conrad Busen for more. Hello, Conrad. Good afternoon. Good to see you again. Hello, Chibi. Thanks for having me back on Channels TV. Right at the beginning of this week, a financial market torn between the escalation of the U.S.-China dispute with Trump administration targeting social media platform TikTok on one hand, and of course, the positive economic data from various countries on the other hand. What's most important for people uh, where you are? Well, of course, the China-U.S. spat and uh, the story around TikTok is the more exciting story. More important for the market is definitely this economic data which was reported today. Uh, purchasing managers all over the world in many different countries are more optimistic. In China, for example, the... Kaishin index, the purchasing managers index there, jumped to 52.8 points. That's comfortably above the threshold that indicates a growing economy. And remember, the Kaishin index is considered on the financial markets to be more trustworthy than official government data from China, exactly because this Chinese Chai Kaishin index is not an official government uh, piece of data. It comes from the media group Kaishin, which is considered to be, for Chinese standards, relatively independent. Uh, here in Germany, the Purchasing Managers Index, calculated by the independent research group IHS Market, came in at 51.3 points. That is significantly better than forecast by economists, which uh, on average had predicted that it would come in at below 50, now above 50, uh, indicating solid growth. And look at the reaction of the German share index DAX today. It's nicely trading higher at the moment, a bit more than 2% on the upside. Are in the spotlight again with HSBC reporting a 65% profit slump and French Bank Societe Generale reporting a surprising loss. How much of a worry are these reports from traders for traders? That's quite, quite a worry, Jimmy. Uh, both shares, uh, HSBC and Societe Generale, are significantly lower this Monday. Both uh, had to increase the provisions they made in their balance sheet for bad loans, and quite significantly so. HSBC says it expects losses from defaulting loans to be up to 13 billion US dollars this year, 2020. That's about twice the amount HSBC had set aside so far for defaulting loans. Uh, Société Générale has increased its provision for bad loans from 314 million in the first quarter to 1.3 billion euros in the second quarter. Now, of course, it has to be said that all those numbers are very pessimistic possibilities. It doesn't mean that uh, such large amounts of loans will eventually default, but it's very difficult to predict what is going to happen. Remember, in several countries, including Germany, uh, governments have imposed moratoriums on bankruptcies, uh, companies which are unable to pay their debt, unable to pay their bills. They do not have to indicate bankruptcy right now. Here in Germany, this moratorium expires at the end of September, and nobody can really predict what happens when the moratorium is over. 
food. And the healthcare unit of Siemens is planning a billion dollar takeover in the U.S. How much of a risk is this in this time of American anti-globalist policy making? Very good question, Chimmy, as uh, these days every merger and acquisition deal, uh, cross-border uh, deal that involves an American company gets scrutinized. Um, but it has to be said, Siemens has a huge presence in the United States, has had one for many, many years, so it would be considered a very unfriendly act by the American authorities if they really did something against that takeover. 16.4 billion dollars Siemens Health and Ears is willing to pay for the cancer specialist from California, Varian Medical Systems. A takeover that many analysts believe makes sense. The price might be a bit high, uh, a, a capital increase might be necessary, and that's the reason why the immediate reaction in terms of stock price today is negative. Siemens Health and Ears shares down around about 7% right now. Right, thank you very much, Conrad. I guess we have um, quite a number of um, earnings to watch this week and, of course, corporate news coming in uh, into the wires this week. Let's continue to keep a track on them. Enjoy the rest of the day. And in the UK, factories ramped up production at the fastest rate in nearly three years last month as manufacturers reopened plants after the COVID-19 lockdown. Let's kick off uh, the conversation from the data front with Juliana Olanka. Hello, Juliana. Good afternoon. Well, the headline manufacturing PMI from IHS Market and CIPS rose to 53.3 in July in the final reading of the the highest reading since March 2019. What contributed majorly to that performance? Uh, good afternoon, Chimazi. Well, it was the easing in lockdown, wasn't it? It was the uh, the fact that uh, production could be ramped up. There were more uh, people that had come off furlough. Uh, consumer confidence was there. So it's important to note that all three subsectors of uh, manufacturing did see an increase. Um, nationally, there was also an increase in orders. Um, but it's important to note, note that exports have actually decreased. So we're not really seeing anything from the international market. But this is great news, of course. Of course, the PMI, what it does is it just takes a forensic look at what's happening in the private sector. It's marked from 1 to 100. Um, so anything above 50 is obviously great, and it shows that there's an expansion. I believe in June it was 50.1. So the fact that it's risen to 53.3 is excellent. There was a flash indicator last week showing that manufacturing could be 53.6. It's obviously been revised a little bit, but this is, is a great news story. And it's good to show that at least during the lockdown, even though there are so many other pressures um, within um, the different sectors in the UK. The fact that manufacturing has taken the lead is fantastic. We'll be keeping a close eye on services, which is, of course, is the uh, key crucial sector here in Britain. Mm. Great news indeed, but how much of this data is reflected in market performance so far today? Well, the FTSE's turned around at intraday. It was, it did start on the low in the red, but it's picked up. It seems as if mining uh, is taking sentiment there. Silver, it was gold a couple of weeks ago, but silver is apparently where everybody's putting their money on. Let me just read this to be right. It's actually risen. An ounce of silver has risen to $24.19. So if you've got your money, that's where you want to put it in. Apparently, this is um, the best performance for silver since December 1979. So all the mining stocks are up on the all share. The all share is up 0.45%. The FTSE 100 is up by 0.56%. And the FTSE 250 down by just 0.01%. In the currencies market, the British pound is down on the US dollar by 0.45%, up on the euro by 0.01%, and down on the Japanese yen by 0.32%. Well, I'd rather go for gold than silver. Anyway, the highlight in the UK this week is the Bank of England's monthly policy decision and, of course, the latest quarterly growth and inflation forecasts coming up on Thursday. What are the expectations on these? And not much, really. I think, of course, we're definitely going to be uh, keeping a close eye on that. All traders will be across the world because it is the Bank of England. But already, just last month in June, they increased quantitative, quantitative easing by £100 billion. Pounds. That certainly can't happen uh, again so soon. And we're not expecting um, interest rates to 
be changed at all, currently standing at 0.01%. I think really what we want to hear is what they are going to say or not going uh, to say. We know that at the moment uh, the furlough scheme has changed. It was at 80 percent. It's now down to 60 percent. Uh, what are their thoughts on unemployment? That's going to be interesting. Of course, it tapers off completely in October um, and we are expecting mass redundancy here in the UK. Unemployment currently stands at 3.9 uh, percent. Some estimates have that rising to about 13 percent. So there are some forecasts that expect there to be an increase in QE um, in November, potentially. We'd also like to see what uh, the Bank of England are going to say about this second wave of COVID or, as the experts say, not the second wave, just the increase in infections. Greater Man Manchester, um, the British government have called the situation that's happening there a serious incident. There were pictures over the weekend of lots of people in Manchester flouting the government rules about not going out and uh, really packing themselves into bars and clubs and restaurants. And we've seen over the weekend that, that the, the, the rate of infection there has increased by a double. There are some suggestions that perhaps we could see another lockdown here in London. This is really going to affect businesses and we are um, likely to see a comment by Andrew Bailey on this. Andrew Bailey, the current governor of the Bank of England, quite early on said he would rather see a prolonged lockdown here in the UK uh, than having to lock down again. And there are uh, some suggestions that perhaps Britain could go or some parts of England could go back in lockdown. So, yeah, that's what we want to hear from them, Jimmy. We want to see the comments on unemployment and the comments on uh, the second wave of COVID-19. We're not expecting anything else from them on Thursday. And just as you said, We'll continue to keep a track on those. Enjoy the rest of the day, Juliana. And stocks in Asia Pacific were mixed today as US China tensions continue to heat up. In Japan, the Nikkei 225 jumped 2.24%, while the Topics Index advanced 1.78% to end its trading day at 1,522.64. Those moves followed the nearly 3% tumble in Japanese stocks on Friday. Mainland Chinese stocks were higher on the day, with the Shanghai Composite up 1.75%, the Shenzhen component rising 2.395%. Hansing index in Hong Kong shed about 1% as of its final hour of trading. Hong Kong listed shares of HSBC sank more than 5%. South Korea's Kospi closed fractionally higher at 2,251 points. Over in Australia, the S&P ASS 200 ended its trading day below the flat line at 5,926 points. And futures contracts tied to the major U.S. stock in indices were higher in the morning as investors turned their attention back to Washington and the economy after a busy week of corporate earnings. Dow Jones Industrial Average Futures rose 94 points or about 0.4 percent. S&P 500 and Nasdaq 100 futures gained 0.5 um, percent and of course 0.9 um, percent um, each. Stock futures got a boost after Elegantly said it began phase three trials of a drug aimed at preventing coronavirus shares of Elegantly rose for more than 1.5% in the market. Apple, Amazon and Facebook all posted far better than expected profit results uh, on Thursday evening that showed even one of the worst pandemics in the modern era has yet to have a material impact on their bottom lines. But with some of Wall Street's most important second quarter earnings reports over, investor attention now shifts in earnest to Washington between COVID-19 relief and an upcoming jobs report. All right, we'll leave the markets now. And um, of course, here on the African continent, shares in South Africa, ShopRite Holdings went up over 11% today after it reported higher total sales and said it was considering the sale of all of or a majority stake in its Nigerian subsidiary. The company, which owns more than 2,800 outlets across Africa, said in a trading update it was pursuing the sale after reviewing its operating model and receiving approaches from various investors. The continent's top supermarket has been reviewing its long-term operations in Africa as currency devaluation, supply issues and low consumer spending in Angola, Nigeria and Zambia have weighed on earnings, with total sales rising 6.4% 
percent to 156.9 billion rand in the 52 weeks to June 28. It said its full year headline earnings per share could rise despite the impact of coronavirus and an already announced impairment charge. Its South African supermarkets division grew by 8.7 percent, while sales at its supermarkets outside South Africa, excluding Nigeria, fell 1.4 percent. Its South African supermarkets were boosted by a strong second half performance. The group plans to publish its 2020 year-end results on September 8. And when we come back after the break, we we'll look at South Africa's economic outlook. Do stay with us. Well, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development recently published a new economic survey focusing on South Africa and the impact of the coronavirus pandemic. Unsurprisingly, the group noted that the pandemic and ensuing lockdown have triggered a sharp drop in activity. The report noted that the 2020 recession follows almost a decade of modest growth, persistent electricity shortages, rising government debt and policy uncertainty will continue to hold back investment and underscore low growth. It says the economy is set to recover only progressively from the coronavirus recession as sectors reopen. The OECD added that a recovery could differ widely depending on whether a second coronavirus wave presents itself later in the year. Well, I'm being joined by a senior analyst, Sub-Saharan Africa Research at Docker Frontier, London, Matt Kindiger. Hello, Matt. Thank you for joining us. Hello. Thank you for having me on the show today. So given the impact of the economy of the first wave of um, coronavirus, how would a severe second wave change South Africa's growth outlook in 2020 and, of course, 2021? Right, yes, so um, it, quite severely, in fact. So it's worth mentioning that uh, under our current view uh, for the economy, uh, whereby we don't see a second wave, so if we assume there is no second wave for the economy, uh, we would expect uh, the economy to contract by 6 or 7 percent this year, so quite a deep recession, um, with a bit of a stabilization in early 2021. Um, and even under this more optimistic scenario, we wouldn't expect the economy to return to its 2019 levels until 2023. So in the event of a second wave of coronavirus, which results in um, stricter lockdowns uh, and weaker global economic growth, uh, we could see the economy fall uh, into a recession of about 10 to 15 percent uh, in 2020 and continue to contract into 2021. Um, uh, and so this would be uh, quite quite severe, and it would mean that the economy wouldn't return to its uh, pre-pandemic levels uh, until about 2024 or 2025, but quite a significant impact. And last week, the IMF agreed to lend South Africa about um, $4.4 billion, the largest loan issued to an African government since the beginning of this um, coronavirus pandemic. How significant is this, and uh, how will it affect the government's ability to provide additional support to the economy? Yes, so, so this is certainly a very significant development, uh, both in terms of the size of the loan from the IMF, but also because uh, this is the first time uh, that the ANC government has uh, sought support from the IMF uh, since coming to power in 1994. Um, so broadly, uh, uh, in the short term, it's very positive, um, because this will mean that the IMF loan will help to fund uh, some of the government's stimulus package uh, that was detailed in the June supplementary budget, and this includes things like support for local businesses, uh, higher unemployment benefits, uh, social and uh, welfare spending, as well as as well as more funding uh, for uh, the health sector, to combat the coronavirus pandemic. So it's so a broadly very positive. Um, but looking ahead, uh, the IMF hasn't really attached significant uh, uh, conditions to the loan. Uh, they have been quite light in in the conditions, and this means. Um, that despite encouragement from the IMF, uh, this means that the, the South African government is unlikely uh, to accelerate the, the pace of much needed structural economic reform uh, over the coming months in, uh, in the economy. Yeah, and the finance minister is due to give a midterm budget statement in October. Now, given the weak state of government finances, what can businesses expect over the coming months? Yes, so definitely. Even though the um, the country has received an IMF loan, uh, government finances do remain weak, and we are expecting uh, the 
uh, the midterm the midterm budget statements in October to reveal continued weakness in government finances. Um, uh, we will see more plans about what the government wants to do to stabilize its fiscal deficit and, and debt levels as well. Um, what we are expecting is a bit of a fiscal deterioration, and this increases the risk of uh, South Africa being further downgraded by credit rating agencies. Um, this would result in weaker market sentiment, international investment in South Africa, and this could drive RAND volatility. So, so businesses really should expect uh, greater exchange rate uh, uh, instability in, in South Africa over the coming months. Another thing worth mentioning is that uh, businesses will have to contend with continued rolling blackouts, known as load shedding in South Africa, uh, for the foreseeable future. These resumed in July uh, and will continue for, for quite a while um, as ESCOM tries to deal with the maintenance backlog and increased demand. And this will have uh, quite significant impacts on, on many companies in the private sector, especially B2B, such as uh, you know companies in the manufacturing sector. All right, thank you very much for your time, Matt. Matt Kinniger is a thank senior you. analyst, Sub-Saharan Africa, Docker Frontier, London. And the shortage of dollar in the money market in Nigeria, no doubt, is taking a toll on businesses. The shortage of dollar worsened after the coronavirus pandemic caused a crash in oil prices. The country's main export slashing government revenues and weakening the Naira on the black market where many companies source dollars. As women in anti coronavirus masks and hairnets sought through folded nappies coming off a conveyor belt. The head of the Nigerian firm they work for wonders how much longer he can afford to keep them in employment. Let's watch this. Rows of women clad in masks, hairnets and brightly colored robes stand several meters apart as they saw through piles of folded nappies coming off a conveyor belt at a factory in Nigeria's commercial capital, Lagos. Wemi Industries, the sanitary products company that employs the women to place the nappies in plastic packaging, has been struck by a dollar shortage since the start of the year that has choked import-dependent businesses. The dollar has been very challenging, so we've had to consider going to the para market and also mix, get the little we can get from the official market, get some from the Paramount and blend it to help with our operation. But in spite of that, it's been very difficult. Nigeria plans to unify its multiple exchange rates over the next 12 months, and in a policy that it has used to manage pressure on the Naira, which has caused dollar shortages. Total outstanding credit lines for Nigerian banks range from between $8 billion to $9 billion, well, the banks say around $2 billion has passed repayment date. Foreign investors have been waiting to repatriate between $1.5 billion to $1.8 billion since March, which has grown to around $2 billion as more investments mature. It means that we have to squeeze harder, increase our prices, and it slows down business, basically, in effect. So we're, we're likely not to have enough goods in stock at some point. Uh, because of the, the reorder cycles that we have. The correspondent banking operations boomed over the last decade as offshore lenders looking to tap into trade flows to Africa extended credit lines. But most are now scaling back as shaky economies face low commodity prices. It helps us to be creative, look for ways to get the same products locally. And we are now focusing on looking for any little local manufacturer that can kind of replicate what we import. But it's very difficult. But we are, we, are, we are finding some small opportunities here and there and taking advantage of it. Yeah. The central bank has rationed forex sale for imports and loan repayments, but is yet to resume sale to investors to repatriate funds as reserves dropped 19% from last year. And finally, Kenya Airways has resumed international flights heading to about 30 destinations for the first time since the routes were suspended in March due to the coronavirus. The carrier in which Air France KLM holds a small stake resumed domestic flights in mid-July after the government cleared local air travel. For the rest of the year, the airline expects demand to remain below 50% of capacity, but it will increase flight uh, frequencies depending on demand. That's a wrap on the program. Thank you for watching. I'm Chimizi Obi. Welcome.